All right, church family, we're back with you again for another week of Bible study over the book of Romans. We are in Romans chapter 6 uh, this week. Uh, Marcy, uh, how many how many verses are we going to try to get through? Uh, we're going to try to get through uh, 1 through 14 okay. tonight. About half of chapter 6. So it's a great section of scripture. I, I'm glad you're with us. Uh, participating with us in this Bible study. Again, I want to encourage you to, to leave comments and questions, and Marcy and I will watch out for those and uh, be ready to, to answer those as we uh, as we come in. But I'd love to have discussion on what uh, things we kind of talk about and what the Scripture says. Uh, and so if that's something that you feel like participating in, we'd love to see those either on Facebook or on YouTube. Just put those comments on there. Uh, an announcement that I want to make for this Sunday uh, it's Easter Sunday, and so what we're going to be doing in Bloomfield, we do have the uh, capabilities of doing uh, a drive-in Easter service, so we'll be doing that in Bloomfield. I think we're going to try to do that as a Facebook Live on our Grace, Book, Grace Point Church Facebook page, and uh, we'll try to do that there. And then on our YouTube streaming, live stream, Marcy is going to preach from here in Sheraton, and so we'll have both of those available to you um, and we'll we'll work out times and get that posted. I'm not sure if we've even talked about times being different or not, but uh, we'll we'll make sure we get everything in that info to you, whether it's on Facebook or through email or whatever. Uh, and so we'll be doing those two different services on Easter. You'll be able to watch one of them live, watch the other one later, however you want to do that. Maybe you got two screens at home and you want to watch them both. As we uh, we can do a little dual preacher kind of action on that. But uh, it's going to be a great great Sunday to to celebrate Easter. Um, even though we, we can't be physically together celebrating the risen Savior, uh, He is risen. And I cannot wait to proclaim that on Sunday morning. Also be on the lookout on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday of this week. We'll have a video uh, put on, on YouTube and on Facebook uh, with Marcy and myself and Dorothy Day reading some scriptures that go along with uh, the Holy Week um, liturgy. So uh, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday. Those things, those scriptures will be read, and you'll be able to participate in those as well with us. So good stuff coming. Uh, we're working hard to make sure that you stay connected uh, with us, with our church members, and, 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 and just can stay connected with God through the reading and studying of his word. That's what we're here to do. So uh, we're glad that you're with us. Uh, stick with us. We're going to have a good discussion here tonight. Let me turn it over to Marcy to pray, uh, and I'll close us out in prayer before we get started. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us. And we just are so thankful that we get to come together and to read your word and to learn more about you. And Lord, I just pray that you open up our hearts and our minds to what it is that you want us to learn tonight out of what we're reading. And Lord, I have a few specific prayer requests. I pray that you... You continue to be with Roy and Sherry in this situation that they're going through, um, the medical issues. And, Lord, I just pray that you be in, continue to be in that situation and continue to, to show them that you're right there and that you just love them so much. And, Lord, I pray for um, a person in our church today who's, who's working at a care facility and then she's on that front lines every day. And, Lord, I just pray that you just be with her. And I pray, Lord, that you be, continue to be with the, those that are working on the front lines of this whole thing um, in both of our churches. And, Lord, I just pray that you continue to be with them and continue to guide them and just continue to show them that you're right there with them through all of this situation. Oh, God, we just, we do, we thank you for the beauty of today. God, I know that uh, sometimes even... You know, right now we're supposed to be staying away and from each other and staying away from other people. And, and a day that, that we had today, it's so easy to go outside and just enjoy your creation. So I pray, Father God, that as, as weather continues to get better, uh, that we will have those opportunities, even just as families, uh, to enjoy your creation. Father God, I pray that uh, you would be with those who are battling this this uh, the social part of this stuff, whether it's in hospitals, um, we've got several people as Marcy just prayed, that are, that are battling there, but also other people that are still working jobs where they have to go in and, 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 and interact with the public and interact with, with different coworkers that, that, and, and they don't know who else they've been in contact with, Father God. We're putting our faith and our trust and our hope in you that, that no matter what happens in this, we are secure in your arms. Not that we will we'll never face uncertainty and harm in this world, but that no matter what we face, you're right there with us. 
you're always with us, Father God. And we just we thank you for this time together. Would you bless uh, both of our churches, all the people that call our churches home? Father God, we love you. We praise you. Be with us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Marcy. Well, Romans chapter 6, I want to encourage you to, to open up your Bibles and turn there, and then I'll turn it over to Marcy to uh, get us started. Yeah, um, so we're going to be in Romans chapter 6, um, verses 1 through 14, and kind of the themes of this chapter 6 are justification and sanctification. And real quick before we, we open this up, I wanted to read out of this. Um, this is a the Romans Bible study. Some of the questions we've had have come out of this, and it's written by N.T. Wright, but he kind of sets up the discussion that's kind of in this um this chapter. So he says, the story of the prodigal son is a familiar one. The youngest son twists his father's arm for his share of the property, goes off and spends it all, and comes home. He thinks in utter disgrace. Then, to his astonishment, he finds his father running down the road to meet him and throwing a huge party in his honor. He is welcomed back as a son, even though he doesn't deserve it, and even though his older brother grumbles. Now come forward a year or two and imagine a thought, a thought um, stealing unbidding into this young man's mind. Life has settled down to a reasonably humdrum existence again. His older brother tolerates having him around, more or less. His father's getting older. He remembers with a happy sigh the day he came up the road and his father came running to greet him. And he thinks, supposing I did this again, why not help myself to enough things to survive, run away for a few weeks, and then play the pennant and come back again? Maybe I'll get another party. Absurd. Unthinkable. Don't you believe it? It's exactly what a great many people think. God will forgive me. That's his job. Paul probably met exactly this line of argument again and again. And chapter 6 is written at one level at least, to answer this point. And so that's kind of where Paul starts out, and we'll go ahead and read um, 1 through 14, but that's kind of where, where Paul starts out in this thing when he starts out with this rhetorical question that we're going to read here in just a second. But that's kind of the idea is, oh, well, you know, every time we run away, we could have this party. So why don't we just continue to run away again? So let's go ahead and read through this um, piece of scripture here. Chapter 6, starting in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin." Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Good stuff. So um, I said the theme of this specific section, so 1 through 14, is a new life under the sovereignty of grace. Um, so like I said, Paul kind of starts out with a, another one of his rhetorical questions that we hear from Paul so often. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace, grace may increase? <laughs> and Paul's emphatic answer, by no means, you know. Um, 
And then, like there in verse, in the rest of verse 2, um, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Um, to be alive in something is to exist within its sphere of influence. So to, to be alive in sin would be to exist in its sphere, sphere of influence. But to be dead in something is to be out of that sphere like of that. influence. I like that. Yeah, I mean, you, you look at, uh, so, so we, we got to start. We're, he's talking to people who, um, are, are, who, are, who have made this claim of being followers of Jesus Christ. So he's talking to Christians. So if you identify yourself as a Christian, he's, he's talking to you here, right? So if, if, if he's talking to us, and so I want you to kind of imagine that he's talking to you. We are those, so as Christians, we are those who have died to sin. Have you died to sin? You have to ask yourself that question. How can we live in it any longer? If you've died to sin, it's not going to be in you. It's not going to be around you as far as your concern. Like if there's still going to, the devil's going to be working on different things around you. We live in a fallen world, all those kinds of things. But Paul is clear here. If you have died to sin, its influence is done. I love, I love the way that that, uh, that quote reads there, that that sphere of influence no longer exists. Right. And that's, guys, that gets at the crux of who we are as followers of Jesus Christ. We do not live in sin any longer. And that's, that's, that's huge. Mm -hmm. And we, too, many, too many of us allow ourselves the excuse of I'll, I'll get better or um, <laughs> let me have another party. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let me, let me come back. Let me, let me, uh, come back and repent again. Or, you know, and I don't want to dog on Catholic, you know, Catholicism, but you know, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll confess to the priest on Saturday or Sunday. Um, it just, that's not the way it's supposed to work, guys. It's absolutely supposed to be death to sin. No more in your life. So. Right, right. And that's exactly what Paul says, like, should we just keep on doing this right. just so that we can get more grace? But yet his answer is very clear, by no means. Um, so there in, in the next uh, verse, so uh, verse 3, Paul kind of brings up this, this baptism. Um, and so I wanted to kind of remind us um, that in this piece of scripture, like, Paul took for granted that all the Roman readers were already baptized. Mm -hmm. Like, that wasn't, there wasn't really unbaptized Christians at that point of time that Paul would have been speaking to. Right. Um, and also, like, I wanted to kind of think, talk a little bit about baptism. Um, because it, it, Paul, it, it's more of a symbol or a sign to the death of sin. Baptism isn't, isn't, what brings us to the death of sin. It's just more of a symbol, kind of like what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was last week, the ring, um, the wedding ring. It was a symbol. Right. Um, so, so baptism's more of a symbol. Um, the justification is by faith. So there is a distinction between the act of saving faith and the confession of that faith made by the baptism. Um, and so... Then I have this, um, this quote here, um, and then we can kind of talk a little bit about baptism in general. Mm -hmm. um, but it was out of the, the commentary, and um, Great House kind of gives a quote, and then I expanded what he kind of said beyond that quote. So um, he was quoting uh, Leander Keck. So he said, Keck says, for Paul, baptism does not end in mortality end mortality. It begins a new mortality, one that must be actualized. And then Greyhouse said to that quote, the Christian ethic displays the glory of God honoring him. Hmm. So that, that baptism doesn't end mortality. It doesn't end us from, you know, not dying. It begins a new mortality. So that's kind of that, that theme that we're going to go along here is that new life we have in Christ versus the old one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, in the, some of the next verses, verses 5 and 6, really get into um, the reasons we do baptism the way we do with uh, 
um, you know, dunking someone under the water. Uh, there, there's a, there's a, there's real symbolism in that. And then what he's talking about here, and, and you're you're right on, um, where where baptism in and of itself doesn't save us. Um, and I was just watching a TV show last night, uh, a show called Bull. I don't know if you anybody watches that on there, but uh, in, there's there's a there's a gentleman that wants to have his niece uh, just baptized, you know shortly after she's born right mm -hmm. and like and and he gives this this actually really kind of beautiful speech about her her uh the original sin being cleansed and and being that, that way if she dies that she would be saved because she was baptized as a baby now i i'm the nazarene faith allows for infant baptism um we i i tend to lean towards infant uh dedication or baby dedication um because i i do i do have a uh a leaning towards um, a believer's baptism, um, but I, I'd be okay with a child being baptized. The parents want to take on that responsibility to that depth, but I think he's, it's missing the point in saying that the the act of baptism itself does not actually cleanse that original sin. the The act of baptism shows that you have chosen to participate and cooperate with God in such a way that the Holy Spirit has gotten in you and has cleansed you from your original sin, right? So, like, that's a very real distinction, and I like that, that you've got that on there. There is a distinction between the act of saving faith, which God does through the power of His Holy Spirit. He saves us and He sanctifies us. That's it. And then this confession of that act, mm -hmm. is it's, it's a distinction, and it's one that we've got to be very clear on. Being baptized doesn't save you. God saves you, and that's we've got to make sure that we we are clear about that. And to your earlier point of uh, Paul would have been talking to people that were all primarily baptized. Guys, we we get this wrong in America so much. We 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 maybe will kneel at an altar in front of everybody and get saved, but more often than not, what we're seeing nowadays is too many people are just uh, praying by themselves and and confessing their sins, and then there's no actual accountability within the body of believers. Baptism uh, provides accountability. Like if I baptize you, now I've got the right, and, and you can laugh at this if you want, but I've got the right, and, and I, I remember uh, uh, one of our people in church shared this with me, shared a video of me uh, talking to the church while I was baptizing their their daughter, uh, and, and she's, I, in that I said, now, I've got the right to come alongside and bop you upside the head if you start acting out uh, against what the Word of God says because this baptism is showing what has happened inside of you. And if then your outside actions don't line up anymore, whoo, you got to get back in line. And so that's where this, this church, though, providing accountability, our church family absolutely needs to do that. We need to see more people being led to the altar and praying and then testifying to what God has done. And then, heck, let's go fill up the baptistry and, and, and get them baptized right then so they can even more testify to what has happened. And I think that, that we've gone away uh, definitely from biblical times where, where John the Baptist, where people were getting saved and sanctified and baptized in one day. Uh, we've lost that. Um, we we want to, <laughs> I don't know, we want to meticulously plan everything. I don't know. Uh, I haven't thought enough about that. But the reality is baptism is a natural progression of being saved. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and something I was thinking about um, just recently because I had started reading through one of the books that I have for classes. And we it, it was a whole chapter um, dedicated to, uh, I don't remember what all was in the chapter, but they discussed baptism. Um, but they talked about baptism, and I was really thinking about baptism, and then when I, when I started through the study, like, baptism in Paul's day, like, to be baptized in Paul's day, mm -hmm. like, that was, that was a big thing, because you, you know, to be a follower, and then to outwardly give that sign yeah. that you are a follower. Yep. Um, that was, and I think, you know, to your point, RJ, here in America, like, we just take it for granted. Right. That we can just do it if we want to. Or, mm -hmm. you know, like, there's not that. Whereas back in that day, for someone to be baptized, that, you know, that really put a bullseye on them. I mean, to be a to follower, right. but then to 
outwardly give that. And yet like, it was still an expectation too. Right. Right. It was so like this, man, it's it, the, the next step uh, after being saved is to be sanctified and baptized mm-hmm. um, so that you, be, you are welcomed into the global, universal, whatever you want to say that, body of believers that follow after Jesus Christ. And that's, that's a big deal for mm-hmm. sure. And, and, and we, we've, we, it's a big deal in the church today. But we've made it almost, I don't know if people are afraid of it. I don't know if we're, um, we just don't do a good job of expecting it and, mm-hmm. and, and, and getting in, in there with, with people and saying this, this is what you need to do. Um, part of the reason I think is there's so many other options available for people. We've, you and I have had this discussion so many times. There's, there's so much stuff. There's so many different churches, different types of churches that, that you, can, you can find something that fits your mm-hmm. mindset, your, your, your framework. You can find something that lines up with what you believe. If I don't believe the way a certain pastor preaches, I can literally go down the street in almost any town in America, definitely in any city in America, and find a pastor who will, who will agree with what I say. Mm-hmm. And, and we just, that, that it was not the case back then for sure. And it's, it's a fairly recent phenomenon, at least, at least to the degree that we see it today. Mm-hmm. And we've got to we've we've got to get back to the to, to what the Bible says to do, and baptism. And I don't know if this is where you were going with all this, but it's bringing it out of me. This this uh, baptism is so necessary. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where we see the church unified around the baptism because we it, it brings in the cross. It brings in Jesus' death, burial, burial, and resurrection. Um, it's just it's so necessary mm-hmm. in on, in the life of the church and in the life of believers for mm-hmm. certain. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I just uh, dawned on me what all was in that chapter. And it was all about the sacraments Mm -hmm. that we have in the Church of the Nazarene and, you know, the sacrament of baptism and the sacrament of, you know, the the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. So it was like the Eucharist. It's like we, I don't know, sometimes I wonder if we just... I don't even think about it mm-hmm. when it hap- when we do it, like, or if we get baptized or if we, you know, take communion. So it's like, I don't know, I feel like we've kind of lost that a little bit. Sure, sure. Um, and we, as Christians, need to go, wow, this is such a huge step to be baptized. Mm-hmm. And this is such a huge step to come together with my church family and to have, you know, to... Around the table where everybody's yes, welcome. Yes, yep. I just heard in a song today that I listened to, he turned the altar into a table. And I thought, oh, that's such a beautiful, Amen. a beautiful thing. Like, yes, he did turn the altar into a table for yep. all of us to come if we are willing, you know, if we make that decision to come. So. Amen. Um, so going on in verse 4, um. We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. So in that and on through five as well, in that we're kind of in that, um, as I said in the commentary, it kind of brings out that already but not yet that we continue to talk about. So we're already, you know, um, buried with him through baptism and death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. So we have this new life here as a believer, but yet we're also talking in that what's not yet. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there too I have under um, that is justification by faith, so that salvation and death to sin in that initial sanctification. So that's kind of something, you know, we believe in the Nazarene church is in that salvation, you've got that n- initial sanctification. Mm-hmm. And then, so then we talk about baptism too. So symbolically dead to sin, alive in Christ. And then in that, um, in that, the end of that uh, verse there, he talks about the resurrection. So resurrection or that glorification, that, as I put it, because I didn't really have another, but that final nail in the coffin. (laughs) No pun intended. (laughs) No pun intended. In death of sin. So, like, it's that glorification. So when we die, we have that final sanctification, and that's when we truly 
have that death in sin. So we have that, we can say no, but it's always, it can always be there. Like we always have that choice. It's not until death that it's, that is gone. Where temptation it's, is gone. Yes, yeah. that temptation is gone. Yeah. I think too, so I want to, this is, this is all exactly right. Justification comes when we are saved. So that mm-hmm. salvation moment, justification moment, where we are justified with, uh, in front of Christ, or because of Christ justified in front of God, just if I had never sinned, right? Mm-hmm. That's the way God looks at us. Not that we're just covered, like not that our sins are covered, washed clean. Just as if I had never sinned. That's what justified mm-hmm. means in this sense. On to, and then in that moment itself, we have this initial sanctification, and this is what Paul's getting at here too, mm-hmm. that when we are alive in that justification, we are alive to Christ in our salvation, we've been saved, there is a death then to sin. One happens and the other. Alive in Christ, dead to sin, that's the initial sanctification. And then we grow in maturity, mm-hmm. right? We grow in that sanctification. We're not perfect in that moment, we're not perfect along the but we are growing in that what I am learning about myself as I'm going along this journey, even though I can point at, at a date of October 28, 1998, when I was sanctified, there, there's still been times in my life where I have had to grow in my maturity, in my understanding, where I've had to confess sin because God made, it a, 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 he made, it a, made me aware of sin in my life that I wasn't really um, aware of yet, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's what we've got to understand about grace, God's grace is humongous. So we continue to, to grow in that sanctification up to the point of glorification. When we die and, and that final um, made right before God, that temptation is gone. The, uh, there's no outer temptation, like a person trying to drag us into some sort of sin. And there's nothing, like the, the internal part is pretty much already gone. Like I'm not tempted to, to really do anything. <laughs> I'm not tempted to rob a bank, right? I'm not. I'm not tempted to to really tell any lies. I, I, I and that's because God has done something. Not because I'm good. Because God has done in, done stuff inside of me. To as He has sanctified me, He is making me holy, making me pure, and I'm I'm learning how to follow after Him, right? So that's where I'm able to. I the temptation, internal temptation, is really gone away. Mm-hmm. Um. Now, there's, because of the world we live in, there's outer temptation all the time. And the book of Psalms and Proverbs talked about those tremendous great books of wisdom in, 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 in those two. But So these outer temptations that continue to come at us at glorification, when we leave this world, those are gone. Praise Jesus. Like, that's, that's what we're all living for. Like, we're living to experience the, the already, to, to finish Marcy's point there, it's happened. Jesus has saved us. We can live as if he is with us right now because he is. And yet it's still going to get better. Right. Praise God. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. So then kind of skipping on to six. Um, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled in sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. So once again, he's still kind of talking about that baptism. We were, you know, um, crucified and raised to new life and all that. And so he, it says there that our old self so that where he says your old self is that existence in Adam like we talked about last week that existence in Adam so that was the body ruled in sin Um, so the person and I want to make the distinction it was the person we once were not that our flesh is sinful so being the like our physical like our being physically here is not sinful Um, it's the person that we once were, the person that was living in Adam. Sure. So Paul is trying to, you know, he goes on later, and that's kind of in our notes a little bit later, but not just that our, not that our physical, us being physically here is sinful. Mm-hmm. Um, so not that our flesh is sinful, although Paul, you know, c- tends to talk about that, mm-hmm. but it's not that our flesh is sinful. Um, so, and then going on... Well, quick, I just want to point out, you, I, know, I know you're going to go on, but I, I want to complete that sentence there, which he does in verse 7. So again, just to, oh, just to reiterate, yes. because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Mm-hmm. Have you died? Like, we're all here, we're still alive, but have you died to yourself? Have you died to sin so that you can be free 
from that sin? Have you died to yourself, your desires, your passions, your wants, what you think you want, what you think you need? Have you died to that? Have you come to a point in your life where you say, okay, Jesus, it's you and only you, and whatever that means for me, I'll do it. That's the point that he's getting at here, and it's radical, it's extreme, and yet it's what we are called to do and to be. We cannot be any longer this soft, generic Christianity that has plagued our churches. We must become dead to sin, I believe, if we want to see a great revival uh, in America again, if we want to see in our own families, in our churches, if we want to see the whole power of the Holy Spirit come through in amazing ways, we must be dead to sin. And that's, that's what it's, it's possible, guys. It's so possible. You can't read this, this section of Scripture and not see that. So please, please, please make that a matter of prayer for yourself. Die to yourself so that sin can be gone from your life. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. And so there in verse 8, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Amen. Um, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has a mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So there, that because Christ has been risen from the dead, death no longer has mastery over him. The lordship of death has been broken. True, we will face our own physical death, but we don't need to fear that death because it has no power. Death cannot separate us from the love of God. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Kind of a cool, cool thought. Just uh, you know, you, you asked the question: uh, Did you know was anybody else ever raised from the dead uh, or resurrected from the dead? No one else has been resurrected, right? Lazarus was revived, uh, raised from the dead. It was still his mortal body, though that. Um, ended up because he died again. Like if he had been resurrected, he'd still be walking around with us now, and we definitely all know about that. But no, he was just he was revived. He was he was raised. His mortal body was raised again to life. But he also ended up dying still again um, and, and staying dead, presumably the second time. Um, like th there's there's a real uh, truth to the fact that it's Jesus who has been resurrected, and that's where our faith and our hope and our trust is in the one who has actually broken the the power of death right Lazarus didn't break the power of death he was just revived uh Jesus broke that power of death I just think that's a cool mm -hmm. understanding there yeah so there in verse 11 so in the same way count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus so in the same way count yourself um that count we have a count some versions say consider yourself um so that that count it's actually that accounting term uh which is the same uh that we used as god crediting righteousness to abraham back in chapter four of romans so that that term that he uses there is that same accounting term that was credited righteousness to abraham mm -hmm. so that credited so um that that term so it, in the same way credit yourselves dead to sin but alive to god so consider or count it's more of an accounting term mm -hmm. than just kind of the way we say count yourselves is mm -hmm. you know it's it's the english language and kind of the the way that they would have spoken back then versus how we speak now but um but there, too, in that 11, it points backwards to what was and forward to what should be. Mm -hmm. um, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Yeah, I think if you take that kind of accounting metaphor, you know, you're ma it's making the ledger correct, right? Reconciled. It's the recon reconciliation is a banking term, you know, kind of mm -hmm. an accounting term. So, so pointing back to what was, the way, the, the way it actually happened, and then pointing forward to the way that it should be, like we are made right in that moment. Yes. So in this moment right now, you can count yourself, credit yourself, consider yourselves right with God, exactly where you need, if you are dead to sin and alive in Christ Jesus. 
So then um, in, in uh, verse 12, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. So um, William Greathouse kind of says that he believes that, that when we say that evil, um, obey its evil desires. So he says that we really shouldn't have that word evil in there because it almost leads itself to um, to a different a different belief than what we have. Kind of going back into that, Paul isn't saying that the physicality or the desire of ev- is evil. It's more of what we do with it that could be evil. Sure. Um, so so in putting that evil there, and like I, you know, I could go either way. That's just kind of the point that he made. But I wanted us to kind of point out there that you know having desires isn't evil. <laughs> you know, we can have good desires. You know, being f- getting food <laughs> and getting water isn't isn't a bad de- an evil desire. And we can't say all desires are evil, um, but. You know, it depends on kind of how far we take that. Yeah, I think so. This is there's a there's an idea among people who who have like walked away from church that we've 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 churches have have done a disservice to them by teaching this type of thought like you like we and and here's the reality and and we believe this we are in our nature uh, evil we we are. Um, our, our human nature is like we we will it led to our own devices without the grace of God we will do things that go against what God desires right that's so so what but what the the commentary is saying what what I believe you know the point of that is in understanding you know take that word evil out it's it's again like what you said not every desire is evil can desires be evil yes if they are acted on mm-hmm. um, if they're dwelt on in a thought kind of process where um, they become fantasies or they become uh, this this overriding like I have to I have to think about this or I can't I, I don't have victory over this thought like it's just continuing to come back these desires can become evil but in and of themselves most things are are, are uh, I can't think of the term I want to use but it's neither good or bad mm-hmm. right it's it just is right kind of like money mm-hmm. uh, the 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 Money is not evil. It's the love of money, right? So it's the same thing with some of the, most of our desires that are out there that um, we can desire a lot of things. And I think that God lets us, we're, we're all different people. We, we, things that you desire for your life are different than things that I desire. And, and if I were to, you know, go after the desires of my heart, if I am dead to sin and alive to Christ Jesus, man, my desire, I, I can trust that, that God's speaking to me and placing mm-hmm. his desires in my heart. And so it becomes, I think the evil desires are when we are not dead to sin mm-hmm. and we are, uh, so we, we are alive in sin and, and, and we don't have Jesus Christ actually leading us. Those desires then are evil because it's not Jesus that's leading us anymore. Right. It's carnality. It's the devil. It's the things of the world that are leading us. So mm-hmm. if, we, if you can trust that Jesus is leading you, those desires are not evil. If 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 uh, if if but if the world is leading you, if you have not died to sin and you are not out of that influence of sin, those desires we've got to understand that that's evil and that takes us away from God. Mm-hmm. So. Well, and that leads right into the next point, um, where I, I say there, where Christ does not reign, sin yeah. will. Yep. Um, if we don't, we if we haven't died to that, um, if we haven't died to that sin, then you know, and I'll go on here and talk about this a little bit. So I'm not going to, I'm going to stop myself and (laughs) not get ahead of myself. But, um, so it says, I have a quote there, another quote there. Um, obviously Paul's strong language in verses five through 11 does not mean that Christians are incapable of sinning, but by grace of God and the power of the spirit, however, we are enabled not to sin. But we must say no to its overtures, to obey its desires. Sin seeks a foothold for its illegitimate reign in our mortal bodies. That's good. I like that. I mean, and I don't want to blame right now. I know we're getting, you know, we got a few more verses to cover here. Um, But that idea of a foothold, 
-hmm. Like sin, the devil, (laughs) sin, the world, those evil desires, all they need is just a little thing to grab onto in our lives. And a lot of times that come, that little thing that it grabs onto is an emotion. It's an anger, a bitterness, a jealousy, um, sadness, I think can be a, you know, just, uh, it's an emotion that gets in and makes us feel right in our thoughts that go against the, the will and the word of God. And so as soon as we start to justify ourselves and say, well, this happened to me, so I feel this way, so now I can act this way. Mm-hmm. That is sin, getting a foothold in your life and taking you away from allowing Jesus to reign in your heart. And then if, then what takes place, if Jesus isn't reigning, sin is. And that's, that's a very good point. That's a very true statement. So. Mm-hmm. So in that next verse, that 13, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. So that instrument, um, that word that they used there and they translated it into instrument, it's actually, in the Greek, it was a military term. Mm-hmm. So it was like an armor or weapon. Um, so it's it's been translated armor or weapon in other places in the Bible. And so I want us to just kind of um, go through and read that. And instead of saying instrument, um, just say weapon. So do not offer any part of yourself to sin as a weapon of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as a weapon of righteousness. That's good. Um, so it said in the commentary, we'll f- we are fully at the disposal of God or sin. There's no middle road, Amen. no neutral option. We're either a weapon for sin fighting God, mm. or we're a weapon for God fighting against sin. Like Paul says there, the weapon of wickedness or the weapon of righteousness. Man, that's so good. And guys, I think we talked about this last week. I think it was last week when we were talking about Adam, uh, humanness, and who we are in Christ. Um, and walk, you know, walking that, that fence, you can't do it. It's one or the other. And so, guys, you are either alive in Christ or you're alive in sin. Like there's, there's only one, one of those options. And it, oh. That's so painful for me to even say because I know where I've been in my life. Uh, I, I, I know where, where people that I love have been. And, and a lot of times we think we're good. We think we are. We're, we might even think that we're a weapon for God. And yet if sin is reigning in our mortal bodies, we are a weapon for sin against God. Man, let's, let's be done with that. All right, I want to encourage us to, 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 to be done with that. I want to call us to... Oh, I feel like it's getting pretty heavy. But I want to call us to be done with sin. Like, you can go to almost any other church in southeast Iowa or southern Iowa, and they're going to tell you, you know, you're going to sin every day in word, thought, and deed. No. And I'll use Paul's words, by no means. You don't have to do that anymore. Let's be done with sin, guys. And I feel like I want to have an altar call right now where everyone comes forward. I feel like I need to sometimes. But, But, guys, wherever you're at, You've got to true, and I know we're going to get to. I'm guessing we're going to have a final thought or whatever, mm-hmm. and we'll get to. But man, be done with sin. You can be. Listen to the words of Paul. Let yourselves be used as a weapon for God against sin. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm well, going to preach if you don't yeah, stop me. No. So. <laughs> well, that's what when I read that, um, I literally had a moment like just where I had to put the book down mm. and just go. How many times have I thought that I was a weapon for God and really I was oh. fighting him? Amen. Like, and I just had a moment where I had to, you know, and like you said, an altar call. You know, if you're feeling that tug on your heart, like Amen. I, when I read that and when I thought about that thought, I just, I thought about it and I went, God, if I ever, if I'm ever a weapon for sin anymore and a weapon against you, I can make sure to draw that out to my attention immediately because I never want to do that. I never want to be fighting you. That's why we need our church family to hold ourselves accountable to that. I, 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 
Can I take just a moment to pray yes, yes. for us, guys? I, I don't know who's watching right now. We're recording this ahead of time. I don't know what you're feeling as you're listening to this, but I just want us to, to pray and give you an opportunity um, to, to ask God to forgive you of any sin that you are allowing to reign in your mortal body. Would you just bow your heads and, and pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, we just we recognize that that even though we may we may do a lot of good things for you, at least our, in our in our attempt to, to to do life in a way that pleases you, that 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 we have fallen short many times. And right now, Father God, if there's anyone listening, watching this video right now, that that is saying, "Yes, I, I I'm right now living with sin in my life," God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come in and comfort them. Convict them with the sweet conviction of the Holy Spirit. And just allow them to give that up. Give that over to you. Father God, I, I just I want them to be able to confess their sin, to repent of it, and walk away. So Father God, we want to give them this opportunity. Would you let your Holy Spirit speak through this technology, through this even, you know, a different time that this is being prayed, but yet it's still so powerful that your Holy Spirit can move right now onto the hearts of those that know that they need to be done with sin, to, to be dead to sin, but alive in Christ Jesus. So, Father God, we pray this in your wonderful and holy name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Yeah, so, you know, as we, it's, it just happened, you know, Paul in this section calls us to have this moral showdown, right. yep. that personal crisis right. moment where we realize that, you know, what we've been doing is is against yeah. God. You're faced with the choice. Mm -hmm. What are you going to choose? Mm -hmm. God or sin? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so um, there in, in that second half of verse 13, um, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. A weapon um, of righteousness. Yeah, a weapon of righteousness. So Paul is basically saying there, they said, Offer or present yourselves once and for all. Amen. Be done with it. Yeah. Just be on God's side. Be a weapon of righteousness. Amen. Amen. And, you know, in Paul, it said in the commentary that Paul is saying, let God be mm. God. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that's good. I don't, I don't even know what to say. That. Like that's, <laughs> that God, yeah, I mean, guys. God wins. God can say no every time. And if you've got God living inside of you through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can win every single time. You can say no to sin every single time because God is in you mm -hmm. or he's not. And I think that's the crux of what Paul's getting mm -hmm. to. And that's, that is hard. Just so you talked about earlier, it's a harsh passage of Scripture. Yes, it is. But it's the truth, guys. Mm -hmm. It's the truth. If God is in you, you can say no to sin every time. Mm -hmm. Aren't you tired of of having to come to the altar for forgiveness over and over and over again. I'd rather come to the altar for strength. Every time, strength to continue to say no. The altar is not dead just because we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior and, and we've got the power of the Holy Spirit helping us say no all the time. The place of the altar now is to recognize, God, this is where the devil's really trying to get me right now, and I need your strength to be built up in me so that I can continue to say no. The altar should be the, the place where we go for strength. Not just, it's, it's, it's forgiveness and strength, it's both. But guys, I'm, I, I remember when I was a teenager and I still, I, I still know uh, teen camps I'll go to as a counselor now, and I will have the same kid come to me year after year after year at the last day of camp and say, I've got the same problem that I had last year. I've got the same problem that I had the year before. I want to be forgiven. Amen, brother or sister, amen. I don't want you coming back next year and saying you're still struggling with this. God, if he is in you, will help you say no. You've got to let him. You've got to do your part and choose to allow him to have that strength in you. And that's what the altar is for, for those who are alive in Christ and dead to sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the next quote I have there kind of absolutely goes on with what you said. Absolute freedom is an illusion, and neutrality is impossible. We are free only to choose our master. Amen. Amen. And so um, there, 
they're, you know, kind of skipping on to, to 14. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. And it said in the commentary, victory over sin is possible because of Amen. grace. Amen. Um, but it also That's why we call ourselves Grace Point. <laughs> but it also says, grace is not implicit permission to sin with rec reckless abandon. It's the power of God that liberates sinners from sin's Ooh. mastery. That's good. That's good. And then another quote that I just couldn't get away from, I was trying not to put as many quotes in, but it says, his death has become my death to sin. His life is now my life to holiness. Amen. Amen. Oh, there's good. just so much good, so many good quotes. And then another one. God justifies us in order that he may sanctify us. Amen. And he sanctifies us that we might serve him as his instruments or weapons, weapons. in the world. Share fully in the likeness of Christ and participate in his glory in the world to come. Amen. It's Team Jesus right there. I mean, yeah. really, I mean, that's team, God just, I love that. God justifies us. He saves us in order to sanctify us. Like, sanctification is the goal, guys. Not, not just getting saved so that we can someday enter heaven. Sanctification is the goal so that we can live our lives right now, just what it says here, so that we might serve him in the world as an instrument or as a weapon, to be able to be on his side while we are still living in this world. That's why he has saved us and sanctified us so that we can actually participate with him. If we're, if we're not saved and sanctified, if we still have death that's, or sorry, sin that is active in our lives, he can't use us. I'm preaching again, so I'm, I'll, I'll calm down. But that's true. Like he's, He can't use us if sin is reigning in our mortal bodies. Guys, victory is possible by the grace and the blood of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I'll let you finish. Sorry. Well, I was going to get to what I kind of thought was my final thought, and then if you have something oh, yeah. different, um, go ahead. And But in that Romans Bible study, again, once again, it's, it asked a question, and it said, uh, what is involved in becoming a Christian and then living the life of God's renewed humanity is a change mm. of master, kind of what we've already talked there. So his question in that was, how can we present ourselves to God when we still seem to be under the sway of the wrong master? Like, I just wanted us God to kind us. of think about that. Like, when, when we know that we are, you know, fighting against God and we're fighting on the side of sin, if we're being used as a weapon on that side, I, how do we come to God? We just got to come to him and say, I'm so sorry for being on that side, for doing those things, yeah. for, you know, just like, you know, like the, the prodigal son came home and said, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I thought I knew what I was doing. Yeah. And mm. I didn't. And I'm sorry. And please forgive me. And you know he stays home and he he doesn't he doesn't go back out so that he can get more grace i mean i mean coming to that moment in me you know where you come to god and you say i'm so sorry you know for what i did and i i know now it was against you like i never want to feel that again in in my life like Man. and i know that i've done things unknowing to me against him and I'm just like, I don't, I don't want to do something that I know I've done intentionally against him and have to come back to him and say, I'm sorry I intentionally did this against mm. you. Well, that's so good, guys. What, what master are you choosing? What master are you choosing? Are you choosing sin because it's pleasurable, because it's easier or are you choosing God? Because it's right to choose God. His ways are better than ours. They are, they are just so, so much better. 
and I, and I don't. I, I think everything you've said is spot on, Mercy. And I don't want to belabor the point. So, guys, I think that's that's just that's the final thought. What's who's your master? You have to choose. You know, we, we come to these what we call a, a crisis moment, where you choose God or sin. And we know there's plenty of people. I've done it myself, especially when I was a teenager. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I didn't walk the middle line like I thought I was. I was either on the side of sin or on the side of God. And every time I went to the side of sin and wanted to come back, God welcomed me back and he's ready to welcome you back right now. But eventually I did get, God got a hold of me in such a powerful way that I got tired. I got sick of going back to the side of sin. And so I made a decision to let God sanctify me. It's been the best decision of my life. It can be the best decision of your life. Can we pray? Yes. And we'll close. Why don't you close us out in prayer, Marcy? Lord, we just we just thank you. We just thank you for your word, and we just thank you that you reveal yourself through the reading of your word and through your teachings. And Lord, I just pray that you just continue to be with our hearts this week in this lesson. Just continue to bring it to our mind. Continue to show us what, if we've made that decision, what side we're on. And Lord, I just pray that as we go through this week, we all make the decision to be on your side, to be a weapon for you. And Lord, I just pray that you just continue to be with our hearts and our mind through this. This is such a a weighty thing. Lord, I pray that you just continue to get a hold of us and show us that this is true. We have this decision, and we're either on one side or the other. There's no neutral. There's no middle ground. Lord, I just pray that you you just get a hold of us and just show us that you love us so much, and you want us to be on your side, and you want to use us. Lord, I just thank you for this. I just thank you that you give us this opportunity to come into relationship with you, that we're able to choose that. Lord, I just thank you for that. I just thank you for adopting us in and just for loving us. Lord, I just pray that you continue to be with us through the rest of our week as we go along. Lord, I just pray that you continue to be with both of our churches and just continue to be with the hearts of everybody. I know that through all of this, we're starting to get to that point where we're a little unsettled in this. In the very beginning, we were trying to find this new normal, and now we're just ready to get back to what we used to do, is meeting on Sundays and meeting on Wednesdays or Thursdays. Lord, I just pray that you just continue to show us how we can grow in this situation in the situation that we're in. And Lord, I just pray that you just continue to be with us. Continue to show us how much you love us and how you're right there with us through all of this. We love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.